Hello! Welcome to today's session on color perception. Today we will go through the PowerPoint that you see here, but at various times I might skip over a few slides so that we can do some demonstrations in class. In class we'll be starting out with a really neat video on a monkey named Dalton. I think you'll find that very fascinating. So today in our video we'll start here with our introduction to color perception and then we'll do some conversation on color metamers and we'll introduce something called the color wheel within PowerPoint, although we will save some of those exercises also for class time. So why don't we jump right in and begin our conversation on the introduction to color vision. And one way to think about this is that color is very multidimensional. And we can think of other aspects of psychology which are multidimensional. One that I'm referring to here is that we can think of intelligence as being very multidimensional. Uh, intelligence, for example, might be measured by an IQ test that has a performance component, which is nonverbal, and then it also has a component that is entirely verbal. In the performance component that is nonverbal, you might be asked to assemble some blocks into a particular kind of arrangement and engage in lots of behaviors that are nonverbal behaviors. On the verbal task, we might ask you any number of vocabulary questions or word production questions, and these two kinds of components, the performance component, the nonverbal component, might be synthesized to give us some idea about intelligence as measured relatively traditionally by an IQ test. We can think of other aspects of psychology that are also very multidimensional. Those of us who have taken Intro to Psych have probably studied personality. And we know that personality is sometimes indexed by the quote-unquote big five traits or the five-factor model of personality. And some of us might remember the acronym OCEAN, spelled out O-C-E-A-N. And I'll ask you to think about just for a moment what those different letters correspond to. So if you'd like to stop the video, you might do that just for a moment now and see if you can recall what the acronym OCEAN stands for in personality theory. Okay, if you'd like to return, we'll begin and move on. And the idea there was just that lots of things that we study in psychology are multidimensional. And that's rel very relevant for today's conversation on color perception. We're going to be talking about three dimensions of variability as opposed to the five that we just reminded you of with respect to personality. Whenever we're talking about color, we need to zoom in and talk about the dimensions that we call hue, saturation, and brightness and we'll go through them in that sequence in the next few slides. And in each of the cases for hue, saturation, and brightness, we'll talk about a psychological or perceptual description of this, and then we'll also talk about the corresponding physical description. So you might hearken back to a previous lecture where we described psychophysics, and we had psychological measures on our y-axis, and then the physical measures on our x-axis. So we have psychophysics. We'll talk about today the psychophysics of color, specifically the psychophysics of hue, saturation, and, bright and brightness. So let's go to hue, and we might start out with a perceptual definition, which I'll read to you. Perceptually, hue is the dimension of color that distinguishes among red, orange, yellow, green, and blue as a few examples. And in our text reading, we know that he, that color uh, described this way doesn't have any direct external referent. And what we mean by that is color is truly a property of our nervous system. It's not something that's existing out here in the real world. We recall from a few lectures ago that Isaac Newton had discovered that the rays are not colored and that Billy Wooten had quipped that the red is in the head. So we can use these kinds of labels to describe hue perceptually. If we wanted to describe it though physically, which would be the x-axis on our psychophysical plots, we might say that physically, hue is the dimension of color most strongly determined by a light's wavelength. And we'll take a look at some examples. So here we have the very famous spectrum that you might have learned about in high school where we use these, these mnemonic devices of Roy G. Biv. We have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv would be that acronym. And you can see all of our so-called spectral colors along this spectrum. And we've mentioned a few times in class that to a first approximation, we might say that humans go from about 400 to 700 nanometers in their, their range of visible light. This one is actually going from 425 to 650. Even at 650, we're getting a pretty good red. Okay? So that's our spectrum. 
Right? And now let's see if we can unpack this a little bit by way of graph. In a prior discussion that we've had by video, we talked about different properties of light, including its polarization, and we had some polarization plots where we had the number of photons on this axis, and we had different planes of polarization along this axis. Here we're changing that around a little bit, but there are some important similarities also. Specifically on this axis, the y-axis, also called the ordinate, we could think of this as the number of photons, with this being a very high number of photons, the individual particles of light, and this being a very low number of photons, all the way down to zero, we can think of this as light intensity. If I were to walk to the other side of the room and change my dimmer switch on the illumination in this room, I can increase the number of photons or decrease the number of photons. We would refer, refer to that as light intensity. So we can ask about how much intensity we have as a function of the wavelength of light, and wavelength is expressed here in nanometers, so NM stands for nanometers, not for Nestor Matthews, and you might try to remind yourself of how many, uh, or, or how we express nanometers in terms of scientific notation. So why don't you pause just for a moment and see if you can remember how to express nanometers in terms of scientific notation. Okay, if you're back, hopefully you recall that a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, that's billionth with a B, and that's one times 10 to the negative nine. Okay. So what we can say is we have short wave and long wave light, and in this particular case, we've got a spike of photons coming in at approximately 530 nanometers, and a spike coming in at about 590 nanometers. This particular spike would psychologically be experienced by most of us with typical trichromatic vision, and most humans have that, not all of us do, but most of us do. We would experience that as green, we would experience that stimulation as yellow. Whenever I give this lecture, I wear this shirt, this yellow shirt, because it's a really good 590. So for the rest of the semester, you are invited to refer to this color as either yellow or as 590, if you like. And this will be an important color for our discussion later on when we talk about metamers. So keep that idea in mind, the 590 is a yellow. But you get the notion here that there's a nice correspondence between the wavelength of light and its hue. Okay. We can now ask a related question. Here again is our spectrum, Roy G. Biv, and we might ask you to point out where pink is on this spectrum. We'll give you a moment to look at that. You might be choosing to look at this uh, on PowerPoint on your computer monitor, separate and apart from your viewing of this video. You might get a slightly better view on your computer monitor than you will on this video. This is one of the few times in the semester that I offer you a trick question. There actually is no pink anywhere on the spectrum. That is to say that pink is not really a color that can be assigned to a particular wavelength, unlike, for example, the 590 that we have that corresponds to our usual psychological experience of the color yellow. Pink actually doesn't ex exist on any one location here, and we'll see if we can understand why as we move into our second dimension of color, which is saturation. Okay? So perceptually, saturation is the dimension of color that distinguishes pink from red, as one example. So pink and red are going to have some important similarities, but in our language of our perceptual experiences, we distinguish pink from red. Physically, saturation is the dimension of color most strongly determined by the extent to which a light is localized on the spectrum. And the key here is the word localized, and this is one of the definitions that has tended to throw students off a little bit through the years that I've been teaching this course. Okay. Let's see if we can understand it just a little bit, and we'll show you a few examples. A perfectly localized light would be monochromatic, so this would mean one wavelength, or slightly more crudely, one color. That would be a perfectly localized light, similar to the ones I had shown you in the previous slides. Okay. This would also be a laser, so sometimes I use a laser pointer in class, and what's coming out of the laser is not a ensemble of wavelengths, but actually just a single wavelength. Monochromatic, one wavelength, one color. Okay? And if we do have that kind of physical stimulation, we might describe that as being completely saturated. When we're talking about this dimension along which colors vary, we're talking about the dimension of saturation. Okay? So a completely non-localized or so-called broadband light would appear achromatic it would be completely desaturated. So we're talking about saturated colors versus desaturated colors. We've introduced some terminology here called broadband that will become a little bit more clear in just a moment. 
Let's go back to one of our diagrams. Intensity on this axis, as always. Wavelength expressed in nanometers on this axis. So we're going to pretend that we've got something like maybe 400 nanometers to something like uh, 700 nanometers, and we might be here at something like maybe a 660, a 650 or so. And if I were to show you monochromatic light at that wavelength, most of us would report that it looks red, at least under normal conditions, assuming that we have typical trichromatic vision. So we might ask ourselves on this issue of saturation and localization, how would the stimulus have to change in order for us to have a psychological experience that moves from that of redness to that of pinkness? And the answer is shown here. If this is red, then this is pink. And notice what happens with respect to localization. We can think of localization as the range of wavelengths, or equivalently the range of frequencies. If we have a very, very narrow range, as we do in the case of red, we might say that this is well localized. It's happening at a very specific location, a very precise location. If, on the other hand, we widen that and we have a less well localized stimulus, then we might say that we have a highly saturated stimulus. And so we can think of pink as essentially a desaturated red. So red is very saturated and pink is very desaturated. And you can see it's now offer, it's being shown across a very broad range of wavelengths. And we might say that this is a broad band of wavelengths. The band would be the number of wavelengths that you have. You can have just one, or you can have a small band, a wider band, a wider band. So this is now a broader band of stimulus than its red counterpart would be. And this is the notion of saturation and its relationship to localization on our spectrum. Let's now move on to brightness. This is our third and our remaining dimension in our three-dimensional analysis of color. Okay. And we can say perceptually, brightness is the dimension of color that distinguishes what I will call a fire engine red, a really red red, if you will, almost Santa Claus is red, okay. a fire engine red or a Santa red, from something that we might describe as being maroon. Physically, what's going on? Physically, brightness is the dimension of color that distinguishes the amount of light emitted by an object. So let's go back to the graph that we had, number of photons, that's the intensity of light, wavelength of light. This might be, again, maybe 650-ish. Most of us would get a pretty good red out of that. If this is red, then this is maroon. Notice that all we've changed here is the intensity of light. Okay, so the amount of light has been reduced, but it's still equally well localized. Okay, so it's at the same level of saturation. It's also at the same wavelength, so it's the same hue, but it's less intense. Okay? Our intensity has been reduced. The amount of photons coming from that monochromatic wavelength has been reduced. And psychologically, you and I might experience this more as a maroon and this more as a red. Okay. So we can move on from there now that we've talked about our three different dimensions of color and we can see how they might differ from each other on a physical plot and what the psychological correlate might be. And that's very appropriate as we're studying psychophysics this semester. We're looking at these quantitative relations between physical stimulation, typically on our x-axis, and our psychological experience, typically shown on our y-axis. It's also fun to think about some lights that we might encounter in our everyday lives, and what are they like spectrally. So a couple of lights are diagrammed here. Here we have the relative energy, or the relative amount of photons, across different wavelengths of light, ranging from 400 to 700. And this would be the spectral profile of typical sunlight. To be fair, light is refracted from our atmosphere at slightly different uh, levels across the day. So the amount of red light that we might have in the afternoon is typically greater than what we might have earlier in the morning. But this gives you a general idea about the composition of sunlight. We can contrast that with what we might have in a typical incandescent light bulb. And now both of these stimuli are relatively broad band. And what we mean by that is they span really the full range of wavelengths that you and I can see as humans but they might have different emphases, so to speak. So down here, at this relatively short wave end of the spectrum, we're getting more intensity in sunlight than we might be from an, an incandescent bulb, but maybe that pattern reverses at the far end, or the longer wavelength end of the spectrum. So different kinds of lights are diagrammed here, and it's interesting to muse about how a fluorescent light might be a little bit different from an incandescent light bulb, 
Um, there are lights that you might be able to buy in a, a typical store that would allow you to begin to recover the sunlight spectrum. And it's very pleasant to be in a room that's lit that way. It might be entirely, entirely artificial light, but it has the same spectral composition as sunlight. And those are really nice experiences subjectively. Okay, we can then move on and begin to ask almost from an evolutionary perspective, what is color for? I mean, why would we have sensitivity to color? Why would it matter? And there are lots of ways of answering this. One general approach is just to make the observation that color can be used to make objects conspicuous. And what we mean by conspicuous is to make objects obvious, more readily seen. So here's a diagram that I hope is coming through nice and clearly on the video. If not, it will come clearly uh, to you on your computer monitor if you'd like to take a look there, or we'll see it very clearly in class. This is two instances of the same picture. Here we have color on this side. Here we have an achromatic or grayscale picture on, on that side. Uh, same picture, two different levels of chromaticity. Okay. Uh, and color makes objects conspicuous. So I don't know if this will come across on the video, but in this person's sweater, we have on their shoulder a green patch. You might see it as a light green. Uh, and then we have this reddish area over here. Okay. And I can see very clearly from where I'm standing, that's green and that's red. If we now um, go over to the black and white version, that distinction um, moves away entirely. Okay, so we can ask the question, where's the green shoulder patch in the right photo? And we don't see any kind of designation there, uh, any kind of difference. And what's interesting about that is we can say that uh, we have isoluminant colors uh, in this particular picture. That is to say that we have red and we have green, but it might be that those two are putting out the same number of photons. That is, the number of photons coming to the camera from this region of space and from that region of space would be very similar. Similar numbers of photons, but the wavelengths are different. Okay? If we now throw away the wavelength information, because similar numbers of photons are coming from here and here, uh, you lose any kind of distinction, and now all of a sudden what was conspicuous over here has become inconspicuous over here. We have a special phrase for these kinds of colors when the two different wavelengths are putting out the same number of photons. We call that isoluminant. So here's that word over here. Isoluminant colors have the same intensity. Iso means same. Luminant refers to the number of photons. Okay? So same number of photons, but they differ in wavelength here. We've lost that over here. And this gives us some appreciation for the notion that color can make objects conspicuous. And when objects become conspicuous, then we have some evolutionary relevance for them. Okay. Uh, color can also be used to make objects inconspicuous. That is to say that certain animals may have evolved certain kinds of fur coats or certain kinds of um, distributions of color in their feathers to make them camouflaged. And hunters use this all the time. Uh, color can make objects inconspicuous as well as making colors conspicuous. So I'll let you take a look at this diagram either here on the video or if you want to look at your printout, and I always encourage you to have your printout in front of you, or maybe you want to take a moment and look at this uh, more directly on your computer monitor, a color com uh, computer monitor, and I'll let you see uh, what you might be able to pull out of this image. I'll give you just a moment to turn the video off and see what you can see here. Okay, if you're back, it might be the case um, that some of you can see something here. Maybe I'll not say what is actually embedded and camouflaged in this picture. It may or may not help you to go to this. You maybe can see the embedded object here a little bit more clearly or maybe less clearly. <clears throat> I actually have found through the years students differ on whether they think the object is more clearly seen here or here. But in class, I'll be very interested to hear uh, what it is that you see uh, in this image. And, how this is related to the notion that color can sometimes make objects conspicuous, sometimes it renders them inconspicuous, and that's a, a type of camouflage. Okay, we'll next go on to uh, an additional session on color metamers. This is a brand new term, something that you hadn't heard before in a prior video, but I think you'll find this fascinating. Metamers are physically different stimuli, so on our x-axis they're going to be different from each other, 
but they're perceptually indistinguishable. So we're going to have the same kind of psychological experience with these two stimuli, even though they are measurably different, perhaps from each other by a light meter. A light meter may be able to distinguish their physical differences, but you and I can't distinguish them psychologically or perceptually. So uh, here are some color metamers, and I'll ask you simply to name uh, the colors that you see in the next slide. Okay. So this is not a trick question. Um, this is simply for you to yell out, what color do you see here? Okay, on your left. What color do you see here in the center? What color do you see here on your right-hand side? Okay. And what we will do in class is we will have some colored filters, just like we had polarized filters. We'll now begin to filter out a different property of light. We'll filter out the wavelengths of light by using colored filters. Okay. And what we'll do in class is we'll have you close one eye and place the quote-unquote red filter, that's the long wave pass filter, in front of the other eye, the eye that's open. This, by the way, is in quotes because we really don't have a red filter. That would imply that the rays are colored. We're really going to uh, allow the passage of long wave light, which looks red to us. Okay? And now we might ask, what color do we see in the center bar? We're back to the stimulus that we would have, and we'll do this demo in class. Okay. And then we'll do one more exercise on this. We'll flip the glasses around, and instead of looking through the quote-unquote red filter, we'll look through the quote-unquote blue filter. This is the one that allows short wavelengths to pass through. Okay. And we'll take a look at what these bars look like now. Same bars again. We're holding the bars constant, and we'll ask you to report what you see here on the left, here in the center, and here on the right-hand side. Okay. Now, to the naked eye, the center bar always yellow. At least that's what most people with typical trichromatic vision reported. The center bar looked yellow. Okay. It did not appear to be a quote-unquote greenish red. And I'm going to pause there just for a moment and ask you to think about have you ever experienced any color which was a greenish red? Most people report that they don't have that experience ever. They are colors that don't seem to come together in the real world such that we would describe an object as being a reddish green. And there's actually a very interesting physiological reason for that that we'll come to not in this session, but in some future session. Okay? So to the naked eye, that center bar had always appeared yellow. The filters, though, that we re uh, manipulated, we looked through the long wave pass, the quote-unquote red one. We looked through the short wave pass, the quote-unquote blue one. And these filters revealed that the yellow experience was composed of quote-unquote green light and red light. In other words, all we ever had back over here, was the combination of green light and red light, which is to say maybe something on the order of, say, 530 nanometers or 560 nanometers as the green, and maybe the, five, uh, excuse me, the 650 uh, as the red. Okay? And yet we get a pretty good yellow here. Psychologically, we get a pretty good yellow here. So we can consider a canary yellow paperboard, or even my own shirt, which has a good canary yellow. Its spectral composition would be a single, well-localized spike near 590. I mentioned before that I would ask you to retain that number, 590 nanometers. So here it is. We're talking about something that is actually pigmented, like my shirt is, in such a way that it looks yellow to you. It's a pretty good 590. Okay. Okay. So. When you're looking at my shirt, you're getting this stimulus. But when you're looking back here, you're getting this stimulus. Most people would report that's a pretty good yellow. But this is a physical description of my shirt. And this is a physical description of what was on this, the screen just a moment ago in that central bar. There was nothing at 590 nanometers. There were, in fact, two spikes of photon intensity, one down here, maybe at 560-ish, one up here, maybe at 660, 650, something along those lines. Those are very discriminable colors, but they were superimposed in space, and you had the psychological experience of yellow, even though there was nothing anywhere near 590 in that central bar that we were projecting up here. Okay, okay. so that was an example of a color metamer. Physically different spectra give rise to indistinguishable per perceptual experiences. Okay. So one more time, you couldn't distinguish typically this from this. Two very different sets of physical stimulation, yet they both result in a fairly compelling psychological yellow. Okay. Perceptually, yellow and yellow, you can't distinguish those two. Physically, it's this versus that. Okay. Okay, so that was an example of a color metamer, and we're going to see lots of different kinds of metamers throughout the semester. This is our, our first uh, experience with metamers this semester.
physically different spectra gave rise to indistinguishable perceptual experiences. Uh, here's another example of a color metamer. And hopefully this is coming through nicely and clearly on the video camera. I can never really be sure though, or the conditions under which you're viewing this. But in our classroom, this will be very clear. If it's not entirely obvious to you, we have three different projectors shown in this slide. And one projector here on your left is putting up what we might call very crudely red light, relatively long wavelength light. We're getting something like a green coming out of here and something like a blue coming out of here. And each of these is putting up a circle and we almost have a Venn diagram here with these different colors projected. And what you can see is that in that region of space where the red and the green are overlapping, we get a very salient yellow. Okay? So hopefully you can now appreciate why this is a metamer. I've got a 590 nanometer shirt on in this space, hopefully you're getting a nice yellow, but there's nothing 590 nanometers there. This is simply the joint work of this projector and that projector, which are respectively red and green, to use the vulgar or commonplace description of that wavelength of light. Okay? Another very interesting bit that we see is right here in the center. Okay? Right here in the center, we're getting the confluence of these three different streams and we're getting a very perceptually white looking stimulus in the center. Okay. Okay. So here we have the blue, the green, and the red shown in their corresponding wavelength positions. And we got a very salient white back in this picture. Okay. okay. So we have these three spikes and only these three spikes. That's the only stimulation that we see in the preceding slide. And we were unable to distinguish that white from this broadband light broadband because there's a very wide range of frequencies. Okay? So this would look white to us. This stimulus would look white to us. Those are physically very different kinds of spectral descriptions. These are different physical stimuli, yet they both look white to us. Another example of a metamer. Okay. okay. In class, we're going to do a demonstration on PowerPoint's color wheel, and we'll begin to understand how it is that we can have just three different kinds of projectors, so to speak, or three different kinds of, um, uh, of guns, as they're called, inside of a uh, computer projector or a computer monitor, and yet we can see literally thousands, tens of thousands of colors with just these three devices, one that's relatively red, one that's green, and one that's blue. And we'll learn all about that, Okay? And we'll actually do some exercises in class and we'll make some quantitative changes inside of PowerPoint's color wheel. And while we're changing those physical quantities, we'll always be aware of what's going on psychologically. Okay? What I would like to do here in our remaining time is let you know about some international coordinates that we have for describing color. You'll frequently see these in psychology experiments that describe color very precisely. They'll talk about the so-called CIE coordinates. This is an international commission um, that has tracked and has some standards for describing colors. It's a three coordinate system and it describes color balances for the kinds of mechanisms that uh, you would be using in your day-to-day -day life in contemporary uh, in the contemporary society where you might be looking at a computer monitor that has an RGB kind of control. The uh, computer that you're looking at right now probably has an RGB. Almost certainly your uh, telephone or your, your cell phone has an RGB monitor in it. It might take the form of a liquid crystal display, but even there we still have uh, this three component coordinate system. So we have the CIE and the coordinates here are decimals that are going to respectively correspond to the red, green, and blue components of your display. Okay? So you can think of RGB, red, green, and blue, and it's important that you have them in that sequence because the international coordinate system uh, keeps them in that sequence. The three CIE coordinates must always add up to one, so three de decimals that will always sum to a total of one, and we talk about the first one being R, the second of the three being G, the third of the three being B. So we only need uh, to specify the first two and then the third component, which corresponds to the blue gun, as many uh, display engineers refer to this, th that last number is decipherable because we know that these have to add up to one. Okay? So we can think of the blue gun as equaling one minus R plus G. So here's an example. If R is 0.4 and G is 0.5, then B would have to be 0.1. And we get that by having B equal to 1 minus the quantity 0.4 plus 0.5, which were our R and G values uh, respectively. 
Okay? So let's see if we can estimate some CIE coordinates for these stimuli. I'm going to now cover this screen with a really intense stimulus. I'm hoping that that comes across as intensely on the video as it is right here. And I'll give you a moment to try to describe this color using the uh, CIE coordinates, which actually would have three, but you only need to report two numbers. So what two decimals describe this? Okay, and then we'll go on to this. I've changed the stimulus now. Can you express this stimulus in CIE coordinates? We'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, we'll go on to this one. We'll go on to this one. We'll go on to this. Okay. All right. And we'll conclude with this. We'll, we'll see that uh, we will spend some time in class when we have the color point uh, or the PowerPoint color wheel in front of us. We're going to try to see if we can come up with some kind of extra spectral color like brown. So a little while ago we talked about how pink was an extra spectral color, which is to say that pink doesn't by itself exist at any one point on the spectrum. We need actually a broad range of um, spectral inputs to, to, to have the experience of pinkness. The same thing is going to turn out to be true to some extent for brown. And one of your challenges will be in class to see if you can use the PowerPoint color wheel to derive a really good brown, maybe like the brown that we would have in a Hershey's chocolate bar. So why don't you uh, maybe play around with the color, the color wheel inside of PowerPoint, and we'll certainly do this in class, and we'll see who can get the best Hershey's brown. I'd also encourage you to make any comments that you have on this video presentation. Why don't you jot down some things that were really clear, some things that you thought were unclear, and bring those comments to class. See you in class.